Hello ladies, here we are again in the midst of our unit on osteoporosis. I have taught you so much about how little action there is to prevent osteoporosis by women, doctors, the committees that make screening guidelines, and insurance companies. Well, this is video number 225, and it is the 30th video in the osteoporosis unit. And we're not even at the end of the unit yet. Now, that alone, the fact that there are more than 30 videos on osteoporosis should tell you that it's really, really important. So if you're just joining us and haven't watched all these osteoporosis videos and orders, you are doing yourself a great disservice. If you have my book, all of chapter 29 is on osteoporosis. It's the same in this first edition and the second edition, chapter 29, all on osteoporosis. Now, as much as I implore you or actually beg you to watch my videos in order, I know that some of you just won't. So let's start with a bit of a review. <laughs> you know, I always hope that the review will be so intriguing that you will want to go back and watch all the previous videos. You know, the way you want to go to watch a movie when you see the preview. <laughs> of course, I know that my lessons on menopause are nowhere near as interesting as a movie, but still, I like to think that there will be some degree of enticement. <laughs> okay, so here's what you've learned already. Osteoporosis is an extremely common occurrence for women when they lose their estrogen at menopause. It causes them to start losing bone quickly and drastically, but there are no symptoms. A DEXA bone density test can tell you if you've lost bone, but the guidelines for getting your first bone density test all tell you to wait until you're 65 years old. And by that time, you will have lost almost 25% of your bone or already sustained a fracture. This is unfortunate because there are all sorts of things you can do or take to prevent bone loss or even restore bone. There are both hormonal and non-hormonal medications that can stop or reverse bone loss, but they all require a prescription from your doctor. So today, we are going to discuss the guidelines that doctors use to decide who gets those medications. Now, from just that review, I want you to focus on two things. First, there are two separate guidelines for osteoporosis, two separate sets of guidelines for osteoporosis. One is for who gets the screening to determine if they have osteoporosis. And the other is for who gets treatment after determining that they do have osteoporosis. Now, you already know that the screening guidelines are woefully inadequate. They tell you to wait until age 65 to screen for osteoporosis. Screening is supposed to detect a disease early, before it gets bad. But for that to happen, with osteoporosis, you have to get your first DEXA scan when you first start losing bone. And with the screening guidelines as they are, the screening becomes a diagnosis of advanced disease. So the means are there for detecting osteoporosis early, but the guidelines bar you from getting your first DEXA scan early enough to detect bone loss when it's just beginning. And the result is that a whole lot of women end up with osteoporosis unnecessarily, if you ask me. The second thing to focus on is the fact that the guidelines for who gets treatment for bone loss exist at all. If you're paying close attention, you should be saying, why wouldn't every woman with bone loss get treatment? Well, my dears, that is precisely the point of this video. Because despite the fact that it seems entirely logical to treat all women who have 
osteopenia or osteoporosis. That is not what the treatment guidelines dictate. So now that I've got your attention, and you're probably fuming, <laughs> I'll tell you about the osteoporosis treatment guidelines. And in the process, I'll probably make you even angrier than you are already. But the reason you should watch this video, despite the fact that it will anger you, is because knowing how these treatment guidelines work could prevent you from falling through the cracks and ending up with a life-threatening crack of your spine, hip, or wrist. I think you've already seen that I have guided you in avoiding falling prey to the delayed screening guidelines. <laughs> Why is it I keep using words that imply falling and cracking? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start by giving you a couple of scenarios. And you can decide if you think they warrant treatment. And then I'll tell you more about the actual treatment guidelines. Okay, this is scenario number one. Let's say you are a 50-year-old, thin, white, blonde woman with a history of anorexia, all of which are risk factors for osteoporosis. You do not have a family history of osteoporosis fractures, but you're clumsy and you have a tendency to fall, which is another risk factor. You drink a lot of soft drinks and you exercise five hours a day as part of your anorexic behaviors. So you demanded and paid for a bone density test and it showed that you have moderate osteopenia but no osteoporosis yet. You became postmenopausal at age 45. And even though your doctor assured you that HRT does not cause weight gain, you chose not to take it because you didn't want to risk any possible weight gain, even just one pound. But you are terribly worried about osteoporosis and fractures because you work in a nursing home and most of the patients are elderly women with osteoporosis who lost their ability to live independently due to an osteoporotic fracture. So you want to treat your osteopenia to avoid further bone loss. If that were you, would you judge treatment as reasonable? Would you expect the guidelines to recommend treatment in that situation? Or to at least give you the option of treatment in that situation? Well, none of the guidelines would recommend treatment in that scenario. And if the guidelines don't recommend it, your insurance would probably not pay for it. And this means that unless you decided to pay for it yourself, you would have to endure more bone loss and possibly a fracture before the guidelines would put you in the treatment category. Okay, so here is scenario two. Let's say you are a 75 year old woman. You've been postmenopausal since age 50 and you think you're in pretty good shape for your age. You're very active. You're so active that you fractured your hip roller skating. You didn't fall while roller skating. You merely turned and felt your hip crack. But you told your doctor you were roller skating and he dismissed your explanation that you fractured your hip without even falling. Although you don't understand how you fractured your hip without even falling, you've just accepted that your doctor probably knows best. He said that your fracture does not qualify as a fragility fracture of osteoporosis because you were roller skating. Your last bone density test showed that you had early osteoporosis, but that was almost five years ago. You started taking very low dosage HRT when you were 50, and you're still taking it now. You love this stuff. But you wonder if your dosage is high enough, given the fact that you just fractured your hip. You also wonder if you should be taking more than just HRT. Your doctor uses the FRAX risk assessment tool to determine your risk score. And he says you do not qualify for treatment because your 10-year risk for fracture does not quite meet 
the threshold for treatment. So he recommends just continuing your current management. If that were you, would you want treatment? Would you want to err on the side of assuming your hip fracture was a fragility fracture of osteoporosis? Or would you want to be cavalier and label it a typical fracture resulting from roller skating? Once again, unless this fracture was labeled a fragility fracture resulting from minimal or no trauma, you would not be deemed eligible for treatment. You know, just saying those words, eligible for treatment, makes my blood boil. I mean, why should you have to meet some arbitrary eligibility for treatment? Why do the guidelines for osteoporosis treatment focus on who is eligible treatment for treatment? And what happens if you're not eligible for treatment? It has the connotation of rationing, doesn't it? Shouldn't you decide whether or not you want treatment? I have taught you about guidelines in a variety of videos. And one thing I have emphasized every single time is that guidelines are never about you. They are always based on the entire population. Another thing I have emphasized every time is that all guidelines are economic guidelines. They are designed to determine how to spend a certain quantity of money. They're about cost effectiveness. So there actually is rationing involved. The bottom line is that while there are guidelines for who should get treated for osteoporosis, they do not necessarily serve your needs. Another thing I've taught you about guidelines is that there is always more than one set of guidelines for the matter at hand. Some are screening guidelines to determine who has a disease. Others are treatment guidelines to designate who gets treatment for a disease. And depending on the particular set of guidelines used by your doctor or your insurance company, they may or may not serve your needs. In the case of osteoporosis treatment guidelines, there are many different organizations that dictate the guidelines. These include the World Health Organization, WHO, the North American Menopause Society, NAMS, the National Osteoporosis Foundation, NOF, the American College of Physicians, ACP, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG. Now, they all have differences with regard to the degree of bone loss necessary to warrant treatment, the FRAC score that warrants treatment, other osteoporosis risk factors that warrant treatment, but not one of them takes your wishes into account. Not one of them addresses or even mentions patient preference. So now I'll give you a list of the things that the guidelines do recommend and another list of the things the guidelines do not recommend. And I'll generalize across all guidelines. I will not specify which organization's guidelines recommend which treatments. And that's because not only are the guidelines always changing, but it's just more detailed than you need to get the point. So in general, the osteoporosis treatment guidelines recommend treatment if you have already had a fracture from osteoporosis, if your T-score is already in the osteoporosis range, if your T-score is in the osteopenia range but you have other risk factors, if you have a FRAC score indicating a 10-year risk of fracture of at least 20%, if you have a secondary cause of osteoporosis which is another disease that causes osteoporosis. And there are many things that these guidelines do not recommend. One of the most interesting things they do not recommend is HRT as a treatment option for osteoporosis. You've seen over and over again in these videos how much bone loss is directly due to estrogen loss. 
But ever since the WHI results were misrepresented way back in 2002, the recommendation for HRT as a treatment for bone loss was removed. Before then, it was always the very first treatment option. And even though all the WHI results showed that women who took HRT had less bone loss and fewer fractures, the fear that has surrounded HRT ever since that study came out has robbed women of this as the first most sensible and most beneficial option. So the guidelines recommend all the other hormonal medication options I presented in video 222 and all the non-hormonal medication options I presented in video 224. Unfortunately, if your doctor is not a menopause specialist, he or she may not even know about these options that can arrest bone loss or replace lost bone. If that's the case, your doctor may only offer options that can't treat osteoporosis at all, like calcium, vitamin D, and exercise. You learned in videos 212, 217, and 218 that these things can only help prevent bone loss before you lose it in the first place. And as I said earlier, none of the guidelines recommend allowing you to choose whether or not you receive treatment. I make these videos for you so that you can learn everything you need to know in order to manage your menopause your way. I think of this education as a great big toolkit of knowledge and options that will help you succeed in meeting your goals. I also see it as armor against the things you wish to avoid. And if you don't know that the entire focus of these guidelines is on treating only certain women who meet someone else's arbitrary criteria, you will fall into the cracks. I'm teaching you how to take control of your health and your future. So if you want to treat your osteopenia or osteoporosis, you need to demand treatment and be willing to pay for it. Now don't balk. You probably pay bunches of money for makeup, hair color, manicures, vitamins, minerals, supplements, massages, maybe even Botox or plastic surgery. Why in the world would you hesitate at paying for something that could prevent you from fracturing your spine or hip and ending up in a nursing home for the rest of your life? Or ending your life? One of my goals in these videos is to paint the picture of how different scenarios play out, depending on how you choose to manage your menopause. If you aren't in the medical profession, you don't know the ramifications of your choices. So I try to give you a preview of how different options play out. And I hope you realize how valuable that is. So way back in video 206, I showed you a scale of T scores for bone density, and I used it with all the videos on management options to show you where each option exerts its benefit. I designated three categories of capabilities in the areas of prevention, intervention, and fixing. Video by video, I showed you the scale with the options from each category in isolation. Now, I'm going to put all your options on the scale, and you'll see how they each contribute in comparison to all the others. Now, it's a bit busy, I know. I'll talk you through it. You see the T-score scale in the first row. Below that, you see the designations for normal bone mass in green, osteopenia in yellow, and osteoporosis in red. Normal bone mass falls in the realm of prevention of bone loss, and it's managed by the healthcare or wellness industry. Osteopenia falls in the realm of early intervention, and there is no industry dedicated to that. Osteoporosis falls in the realm of fixin' and it's managed by the disease care industry otherwise known as the traditional medical system. Below that 
in purple, you see all the different options and where they can exert a benefit. The important thing to realize is that the only option that can actually function in all three realms, prevention, intervention, and fixing, is estrogen. Now this is critical because so many women and professionals try to utilize other options to accomplish things they simply cannot accomplish. And if we didn't lose our estrogen, we wouldn't lose bone. Now, here's that same scale again, showing you where the screening guidelines and the treatment guidelines belong on the scale. As you can see, both the screening guidelines for determining who has osteoporosis and the treatment guidelines for designating who receives treatment for osteoporosis are fully focused on fixing. There is nothing in any of the guidelines that serves the purpose of prevention or early intervention. And if you recall what I told you about the difference between the health care industry and the disease care industry, you'll understand why. What most people term the health care industry, consisting of doctors, medicines, and surgery, is really the disease care industry. It focuses on disease. We doctors are really just repairmen. We know how to fix you once you're broken, and our toolkit consists of medications and surgery. If you're broken, you want a repairman. The so-called wellness industry, consisting of naturopaths, dietitians, nutritionists, fitness specialists, herbalists, and acupuncturists, is really the health care industry. It focuses on wellness. These professionals know how to keep you well, and their toolkits consist of diet, exercise, supplements, herbs, and acupuncture. If you're well, you don't want a repairman. You want someone to just keep you well. I think of wellness professionals as housekeepers and disease care professionals as repairmen. You wouldn't ask your housekeeper to repair your house, would you? And you wouldn't ask your repairman to keep your house clean. I actually wrote an article entitled don't let your housekeeper repair your house. <laughs> and it's on my website if you want to read it. It's a really fun read. The problem is that people tend to use these two industries incorrectly. So which professionals in these two industries write the screening and treatment guidelines for osteoporosis? Ah, now you're starting to get the picture. The repairmen write the guidelines and they write them with a focus on repairing you once you're broken. See that's why I teach you about the guidelines. There are no guidelines for prevention. So in the case of prevention and early intervention for osteoporosis, you have to take control. The wellness professionals or housekeepers know nothing, absolutely nothing. It's not part of their curriculum. The disease care professionals or repairmen only care about fixing you once you're broken. So you have to do what it takes to avoid breaking. And that's what this education will teach you. I will function as your safety net. I will be the only person who is going to focus on prevention of osteoporosis and fractures. I will be the only person telling you to get your bone density test when you first become postmenopausal. I will be the only person interpreting your DEXA results solely according to your T-score and being clear about where you are on that scale. I will be the only person who keeps each management option in the proper category based on its capabilities and limitations. I will be the only person urging you to begin treatment when you can prevent bone loss and avoid ever reaching osteoporosis land. I will be the only person directing you in a way that avoids a fracture rather than waiting for you to have a fracture. I just 
disagree with all these osteoporosis guidelines. Why in the world should you have to end up in osteoporosis land or sustain a fracture before diagnosing or treating your bone loss? It just makes no sense to me. So if you want to avoid falling into the huge crack between prevention and fixing, please, please get your DEXA scan earlier than the guidelines indicate and demand treatment earlier than the guidelines indicate. If you do, you'll see your future play out as a really wonderful scenario with no drama in the area of osteoporosis or fractures. All right, I think that does it. <laughs> Come back in a week when I'll explain what happens when you stop taking treatment to prevent bone loss. For a consultation with me on anything from anywhere in the world, go to menopausetaylor.me. Subscribe to this channel. Get everyone you know to subscribe to this channel. <laughs> Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I'll see you next week. Bye.